Hello, everyone, and welcome to the How Do I Knit That podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Dawn of Sarah Dawn's Designs, and this 12th episode of the How Do I Knit That podcast will be going on a slight tangent and talk about makers and the slow fashion movement. So broadly, what is this podcast all about? Well, this podcast came about because I hear so many people saying, oh, I I could never knit that, I I could never make that, and I think that's really sad. I'm a firm believer in the idea that anyone can knit or crochet or, or quilt or whatever your chosen art is. All it takes is some knowledge, the right tools, the right techniques, and the willingness to get a little ingenious. If you're looking for the previous podcast episodes, you can find them on my Patreon, which I will link to in the video description, or in a YouTube playlist, which I will also link to in the video description. This week, we're drifting a teeny bit away from knitting and crafting to talk about the connection between slow fashion and making. Wait, what? Bear with me, because I promise there's a connection. Due to, well, the giant mess that is 2020, I didn't do Me Made May this year. But I've done it in previous years, and I was always impressed at the number of makers who've mended, made, or repurposed their old clothing and textiles. And in doing so, I learned that there's a sizable overlap between makers in the fiber community and folks in the slow fashion community. And it makes perfect sense. The makers in the fiber world, sewers, quilters, cross-stitchers, crocheters, knitters, and more, know the amount of effort and person power it takes to make a textile object. That object can be a hand-knit sweater, home-sewn dress, or hand-embroidered table runner, but we as makers are all well aware of the amount of time and effort that goes into making textiles. So we're in a good spot to recognize the fact that fast fashion devalues the making of textiles, underpays its workers, and often uses inferior materials. We also have the skill set required to assess the quality of a garment or textile good and decide if it's worth the price point. But for those who aren't familiar, let me back up one and explain. What is fast fashion? Well, Wikipedia defines fast fashion as a contemporary term used by fashion retailers for designs that flow from the catwalk quickly to capture current fashion trends. It's a fashion system with merely weeks turnaround between runway and store, playing on fashion trends and social media to promote an even faster fashion cycle. But because it's such a quick turnaround, it comes with a whole pile of problems including inferior quality supplies, labor rights issues, environmental issues, and much, much more. And all this is protected in part by convoluted supply chains, where companies may not even know where their materials are being produced. And in an effort to maintain a cheap bottom line, what's often sacrificed are things like workers' rights, animal rights, and environmental protections. The collapse of the Rana Plaza, link in description, was one major event that brought this into the public spotlight. For another, see the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, again, link in description. But the growth of slow fashion is far from a new thing, which brings us back to makers. Many makers have been participating in slow fashion for years, even before it had a name. I remember asking my mom back when I was a small child why she made our clothing rather than buying most of it from the stores. She told me the quality was better for what she made, and if a seam ripped or a button fell off, well, then she knew whose responsibility that was too. She also told me that, and I'm paraphrasing here, A maker is making their textiles out of necessity, but also out of the love of making. A maker won't accept a low-quality outcome. Someone who's working in a factory, though, has little to no incentive to care about the quality of their work. Quality control, if it even exists, is being enforced from above, and that is reflected in the finished garment. For example, a knitter will, however reluctantly, frog back to fix an error. A quilter will, with possibly much swearing, rip out a seam to fix a mistake, because makers take pride in the finished work. But for a laborer in a factory sweatshop, they're paid by the piece they finish, and they're desperate to finish as many pieces as possible. They're, understandably, not going to take the time to go back and fix any mistakes. If you ask many knitters, they're darn well, pun intended, going to darn those hand-knit socks or mend that hand-knit sweater because they put a lot of hours and work into it, and it's not just going to be tossed in the trash. Ask many sewers, and they're happy to alter a favorite dress or patch a favorite pair of jeans because they enjoy the process and they want to get more use and wear out of garments they already own and may have even made themselves. These concepts of having garments and textiles that you value, that you enjoy, and will repair rather than simply toss in the trash, is one of the major elements of slow fashion, and it overlaps quite nicely with the care and value that makers put into their work. So what does this mean for makers? I mean, even with this overlap, what other things does this mean for the crafting community? Before I answer that question, I want to remind folks, I intend to talk about all sorts of knitting, crocheting, and crafting stuff so that you can create amazing things in whatever situation you're in.
Remember, you can, in fact, knit that. And when I say knit that, I also mean crochet that or spin that. It applies to pretty much any craft I can think of. And for those questions, I'll be relying on you, my listeners and audience. I want to hear what keeps you from knitting or crocheting, and I'll try and address the barriers you mentioned. It can be anything at all. I'll at least try to give you some advice. If you have trouble with a particular technique, are wondering how to knit with limited or no time, or can't find tools that work for you, please reach out and I'll try and address your concern on the podcast. If you have trouble with a particular technique, are wondering how to knit with limited or no time, or can't find tools that work for you, please reach out and I'll try and address your concern on the podcast. I'll even do pattern support, provided the pattern is free online and accessible to me, or one I can find at my local library. And of course, I'm able to answer questions about my own designs as well. You can submit your questions by email and have them be read on the show, or you can submit an MP3 voice recording and I'll play it on the podcast. So, with that reminder, let's keep going. Even with this pre-existing overlap, what other things does the slow fashion movement possibly mean for the crafting community? There seem to be, from my own observations, two places where the slow fashion movement really impacts the making community. The first is that their making informs their fashion choices. And the second is that makers are often concerned about the provenance of their supplies. Let's start with the first. Makers, being aware of the value of textile work, are likely to be more open to the sustainable and slow fashion movement if they haven't already heard of it. Indeed, many of my introductions to sustainable fashion brands have come through fellow makers. For example, I was introduced to Tamga Designs, a Canadian sustainable fashion house, via bracelet and jewelry artist Chic made consciously at an event. I was introduced to Darn Good Yarn via a Yarn and Fiber podcast, and I found both ThreadUp, a US-based online second-hand shop, and Good On You, an app and website that review f- various fashion brands and how sustainable they are, from social media links in the online knitting community. So many sustainable fashion brands have come my way via other maker folks. Don't worry, links will be in the description for the various brands. Both Tamga Designs and Darn Good Yarn do wonderful sustainable fashion choices that I've really quite enjoyed. Tangent, I do love the fact that the darn good yarn and sari skirts are actually size inclusive, and I've acquired some beautiful secondhand dresses and skirts from ThreadUp as well. Oh, and don't forget vintage clothing shops on Etsy. With many knitting and fiber folks having shops on Etsy, it didn't initially occur to me to hunt for vintage clothing there as well, but when I did, it was quite a fun bunch of finds. Many of the makers I've spoken to, in addition to making and mending their own textiles, often look to shop for good value sustainable fashion and often it's the quality of said fashion that draws makers to the fashion. I remember one conversation in a knitting group where someone was lamenting that clothing no longer came with extra buttons sewn on to replace buttons that have fallen off, and the button that the clothing came with fell off really easily. This person was perfectly willing and had the skill set to sew on a lost button, but was lamenting the clothing didn't come with additional buttons. And really, for a fast fashion brand to offer additional buttons on their clothing to make that repair runs counter to the fast fashion ideal. Those retailers would rather have you toss out that now no longer trendy skirt and buy a new one instead. As for the second, many makers are starting to investigate the sourcing of their supplies, looking for things like local, fair trade, and non mules wool, non toxic dyes, non superwash yarn, as well as looking for alternatives to animal fibers, such as organic cotton, bamboo rayon, and recycled acrylic. Makers are also starting to learn about the labor issues in places like China where a good bit of textile milling and manufacturing still happens. They're also starting to seek things like recycled and reclaimed fibers, both synthetic and natural. If the slow fashion movement is asking who made our clothes, some makers are starting to ask the next question about the process, which is, who made the things we're using to make our clothes? Many companies are offering alternatives to cater to this interest in the sourcing of supplies. Knit Picks offers a line of upcycled yarn made with the mill ends left over from each batch. Laurel Hill offers ebony crochet hooks made from old piano keys. Lion Brand has a wonderful line of recycled cotton yarn, and Darn Good Yarn offers some gorgeous recycled silk yarn. But what else can we as makers do to consider and work sustainably within our crafts? Well, one of the mottos out of the sustainable fashion world is the most sustainable wardrobe is the one you already have. And I try to adopt the same idea to my crafting. So look to the supplies and tools you already have and maintain those tools rather than necessarily buying new. Hunt through your yarn or fabric stash for a product first rather than going out and buying new fabric or yarn if you can. Sometimes it's a pleasant surprise to re-find a special skein of yarn I bought on vacation or at a yarn sale, and it gives me new inspiration to see the gorgeous colors and fibers of leftover yarn that I still have tucked away. When you do have to buy something new, see if you can get something new to you. Many times, there's a lot of good quality yarn, fabric, needles, hooks, and more that can be found at garage and estate sales, 
I once got a whole bunch of really nice sock yarn very inexpensively when a theater company was selling off old stage props. Also, look to local crafting guilds. They might also have some crafting spots that can be a great way of getting new-to-use supplies and keeping something out of landfill. For one good example, check out Craftic.com. If you are or will be in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area of Canada, they often do crafting meetups and swaps. If you do have to buy something new, and there's nothing wrong with that, look to companies that have options like recycled or reclaimed yarn rather than virgin yarns. Look for tools that are being made from reclaimed and recycled resources rather than new sources of wood or plastic. And sometimes none of the above is an option, and you know what, that's okay too. Mindfulness about our textiles and clothing seems to be another shared trait between makers and the slow fashion movement. And sometimes that mindful consideration leads us in other directions, budget, ease of use, and more, which is perfectly fine as well. Don't beat yourself up if your purchases aren't perfectly ethical or sustainable. Such a thing is rather a unicorn, but even the smallest steps do help to make the world a better place. And with that reminder, I think that just about wraps up the podcast. A huge thanks to my patrons who supported this podcast. You folks can submit an mp3 audio or mp4 video file of your questions for the podcast over on Patreon. The podcast archive is available on Patreon page, which is www.patreon.com slash Designs. And future episodes will be available here on YouTube as well. Patrons usually get access on the second Wednesday of every other month, and the podcast is available to the public a week after that, so the third Wednesday of every other month. Well, that's it for episode 12. Stay tuned in November 2020 for the next episode, and thank you once again for listening. I hope you enjoyed, and remember, you can in fact knit that. Happy crafting!